What you doing over there? What's going on in Oklahoma? We are firing Can it up here in Smokelahoma, brother. Smokelahoma? That's for real over there. You can grow in Arkansas. We can't grow our own plants, man. You can't. You got to buy it from the dispenser. You guys can have like seven plants or something, can't you? Uh, you can have twelve, six immature, six mature. But now a guy like you probably has more than that, being what you do for a living. Am I am I right or am I wrong? Think about like eight hundred of them. Yes, sir. Eight hundred. Now, did you ever? Did in, you in a full there? rotation, in a full rotation at all times at different stages. Okay, so that could be seedlings too, or just uh, you know something growing above a certain length. Typically, we pull clones from mother plants, so seedlings. Um, only get introduced with new strains typically. So the seedlings are added, but we clone off of mother plants typically. It's for production. <clears throat> See, now you just got really deep right there. That hybrid business has got to be. I mean, you got to do it. Did I fall that. off the deep end? Hell yeah, bro. I was like, well, you've been talking about corn, how those guys down in South America got corn and, and made some food out of it from a piece of grass. Tell me how this business of here works. This is, this is the, this, we've got the cannabis entrepreneur on the line, man. And all the well, so the it. main thing is is that with the cloning, you know, cause the seedling, just like if you had kids, every one of your kids is going to be different. You, then you're going to have that redheaded kid, you dig? So and for to ensure continuity or consistency, um, you want to clone because the clone is going to be an exact replica of what you cloned it off of. So like being able to cut your arm off and grow a whole nother brad. That's basically what cloning does. So, and not only that, as far as the production standpoint, the time it takes, I can get a clone to root, you know, cut off of another plant and get it to root, become its own plant in, you know, seven to ten days as to where a seedling before it can be even become mature enough, you're talking, you know, eight weeks. So a clone, I think about that. That there's good for quality control too. I bet, isn't it? I know, I mean, man. I've, I've I've seen I've seen one time, and I don't know what happened. I've only seen one time where literally, and I don't know what happened. Probably environmental. It went one plant. I've seen go male. That's the only time I've ever seen any deviation from that. That that sounds like a damn size experience uh, experiment right there. But so now. Uh, a clo- see that there? That's that's and, and of course you know like when when you go buy seeds for like a lot of farming stuff, you know it, it just it, it's not perennial. It just does that one time. You know what I'm saying? A lot of a lot. I see a lot of things. Like, well, that's, that's that's a totally different concept. But you don't get seeds out of weeds you buy these days. I guess that's why, huh? Because of the cloning. Now the the reason you don't get seeds out of weed today is because they're actually growing. You know the cannabis. And we're smoking the psychoactive, the female plant that has a higher amount of THC as to where, but you know, back in the day you'd get it with seeds in it as a hermaphrodite, which means it's both male and female. You know, there's debate. I don't know if they've done studies as far as, you know, I've had some that was, you know, hermaphrodite and it was really good, high THC yeah. and, and whatnot, but typically not. You're, you know, if it's seeds and stuff like that, typically you have lower quality, lower THC. And it, it didn't have that quality either. You never knew what you was getting. You know, like you never know what you – if you just go to somebody off the streets and you buy a bag, and I'm, I'm glad you explained it like you did because you, you'd make it scientific. So the quality, I cannot believe the quality of uh, smoke you can get these days. That's what just blows me away. So you got cloning going on. What, what about water? I mean, how do you – do you, are you using uh, open sunlight and uh, – and uh, water, hydroponic. How you? What does that look like after you get it? After you get it cloned, and you get that beautiful, you know, potentiality. What do? You, how do you grow it? Yeah, as soon as it roots, man, we we get it. And the first stage is the you know the vegetative stage, where it's just putting on biomass, basically just growing. Um, that goes under a fluorescent. I use fluorescent lighting. You can use all kinds, but for the cost. And all that, I use fluorescent lighting, the T5 fluorescent lighting, the grow light. Um, they sit in there for about four four to six weeks in the vegetative stage. <clears throat> then they get topped, which is the, you know, the main stem that comes up the center. They'll get topped for production, depending on what, you know, what we're needing for production or what's, what's called for in production. Typically, all of them will get topped or enough to meet whatever production is. Um, they'll be topped, pruned. Um, and then they'll be put into a bigger container and then put into one of the flowering rooms. 
So you're talking four mm-hmm. to six weeks, depending on the strain, too, because some strains grow faster, some grow slower, depending on that, um, depending all on if there's a new guy, sometimes, you know, human error sometimes will cause errors as far as time. But And that's what I was saying as far as seed. From seed start to finish and from clone start to finish is a huge difference in production. It's, you know, you got to have quality and quantity. you got to have that equal balance. You can't have, you know, one ounce of really, really, really good pot and expect your business to, to sustain itself. Yeah, I got you. So speaking of that, you kind of mixed a, a couple of things in my brain that maybe asked you a question about. Uh, down here, the number one crop we have down here is corn. And I, and I may have smoked a little bit tonight, but I'm kind of getting into the groove now, man, you know, kind of feeling some flow. It takes a little bit sometimes. I burned it kind of late. But let me ask you this, though. Like with this corn they got growing down here, they'll grow this high-density, easy, quick, fast-growing corn that has like basically one ear of corn on it. To get it very dense. I mean, is there is stuff like is 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 the kind of uh, genetic ma- manipulation going on with pot to make it say the uh, thirty forty percent pot that we see or, or THC levels we see out there, or is it it's, or is it just a regular plant like you're talking about right there for high production? No, absolutely, man. There's people that make a living uh, with doing the genetics as far as breeding them. And that's what they're doing by the breeding process. They're looking at different, they're looking at certain traits that they're wanting to keep and breeding out certain traits that, you know, are not good for production. Cause that's, you know, kind of what you want. You want a good dense bud and it starts at the genetics. I mean, that's the very first thing. If you have poor genetics, you're going to have poor crop. So yeah, there's definitely, I don't know, you know, the more the, it becomes legalized and the government gets involved and, more legal money gets behind the research. I could see it being more and more fruitful. But now it's mainly just, you know, people like me, random people that are breeding on their own and, you know, just kind of doing the trial and error phase. And there's some serious guru breeders out in Northern California and whatnot. And, and that's when you get in, you know, you'll pay, you know, $500 for a seed, for one seed. Goodness. And, yeah, and it's because you'll grow that into a mother plant, but it's got the genetics that you're looking yeah. for. It's typically a high producer, short time, very re- resilient to insects or resilient to to drought. Yeah, exactly just like corn, man. It's becoming a, an accepted science. So I don't really – this this you, you mentioned something there that made me want to go back to cloning for just a, a second there, but say with that one seed over the course of a year – I mean, how many plants could I get from that if I were to be cloning that? Unlimited. Because as long as you keep, yeah, as long as you keep, man, I I know people that have mother plants that have been alive for for twenty fucking years. Now, I felt not like the that golden goose. <laughs> well, it's it's not that the like the ones I've seen they they'll braid the the trunk of it and you know and they will take clones off it the first few years, five years or so, but then after that it's just ornamental. And they just keep it alive and keep it alive, just kind of like you keep your ivy plants alive. You know, people that grow, they just do weird shit like that. And I know people that have, you know, they don't take clones off of it anymore. They just don't want to, don't want to kill the plant. I know it sounds silly, man, but you become attached to them and you're just like, fuck it, I'll just water it every day and keep it alive rather than kill it. But as long as you keep the light cycle, now this is for, um, they have an auto flowering, which is a, a one and done. But with the the way the cannabis plant is, is if you keep the light cycle above 16, 17 hours of light, it won't go into flowering, and it'll stay in the vegetative state its whole cycle. It'll just stay in it, and it'll just keep producing like it was, you know, in the vegetative state. It never goes into flowering until you reduce the light cycle, you know, and that's the natural, you know, when the earth tilts, you get the winter the fall the light cycles change the light spectrum changes as well so it picks up on more red light and then that the light cycle is starting to get lower and lower it picks up on that and then it starts fruiting starts flowering but until that happens it stays in the vegetative state so you, as long as you keep that light cycle say 24 hours you could literally probably keep it going forever as long as you had that light on and it never went into flowering and then once it goes into flowering, you can change it back and send it back into vegetative state if you wanted to. It's a very versatile plant. You know, it's a, it's a weed basically. It's, I don't know, it's hard. 
it's hard to kill them. So, so let me ask you this though. So, like now, let's just at the at the like a, whatever season it goes into where it quote unquote dies. Is it into a deeper med or sleeping state? Does that one come back? Does it regenerate, or is it dead? And just the seedlings that it produced. Well, typically, other, right? yeah, typically if you flower it, and once it goes so far in the flower, and I've seen people take it back in the vegetative state, but then you get some retardations in the. It's, it's always typically something. It's rare that you're able to take it that far. It seems like once you get so far into the flowering stage, you cross the the point of no return. Is is my experience with it. But I've seen people save it because of genetics and whatnot, and and, and put it back, you know, in the full flowering, and then put it back in the vegetative state, and try to clone off of it. And they were successful, but it was never like the original. It was really, really close, but they've always lost something in that process. Stressing the plant out a lot is what that does. Yeah, I, I get that. It's like I just way too much, you know, variation. You know, I, I've over the years I've ran across there's there's so many different genetics that I've seen. You know, if you go you just go to a, even a hemp page, CBD, where I spend a lot of my time, but I spent you know a lot of my time with the THC as well. And you see these various you know cross mixings of things. You know, whatever there's there's variations of OG Kush. You know, but it's but it's like with some kind of a skunk and some other kind of a, something else, and and then you got uh you know a something called a gelato versus uh you know a skunk. I mean, um, and then you got all these hybrids. You know, when I think of some of those, there's certain smells that go along with a sativa and certain you know the the way the flower is, the short, long stem or uh, leaves and all this, all this variation. I mean, you know, you, you talk about being a very strong, uh, you know, resilient plant, but it's also, I mean, you know, just if you if you if you go look up the word landrace and then look up, you know, cannabis landraces, I mean, you'll see this thing grows everywhere, and I mean, just variation upon variation, but chemically it looks pretty the same, or you know, pretty similar. I mean, what does that what does that make you think about? I think that it should be in every civilization that's on Earth. I mean, it literally, I think besides Antarctica, which it may, you know, that we may find out one day it did grow there at one time. But I think, I believe every continent has it on it. And like you said, the land race strains, you know, you pretty much have certain strains that dominated each continent or each, you know, area. And then through breeding and stuff, like you said, you, we've been able to isolate different there's so many variables. They've been able to isolate different variables to get desired results, like something that smells like cherries or something that smells like a skunk or something that gives you couch loft where it's a body high, you know, and then the mind high. And then, like you said, with CBD, where you actually have medicinal effects from it as well. I think it's nature or God's way of saying that, hey, this needs to be with humans, and this is like kind of the kick in the ass to keep keep the, the ball rolling in the right direction is what I think. Well, I mean, you know, our brains do Stone have... Stone ape theory type. They, yeah, for sure. Well, yeah. And, and with cannabis, I mean, we have receptors for it in our brains. I mean, we we co, we co were in co-evolution with this thing is what I'm trying to say, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, I mean, a lot of receptors for, for CBD and THC. I mean, there's there's a lot of them, and you're going to tell me that God or nature or whatever made the mistake, and you can tell them that. I think that it was, you know, we're made for them for a purpose to be used. Well, let's, let's I want to, I, you know how I am, I'm ADHD, so I want to squirrel, but I want to come back to some pot in just a minute, but you threw it out there, so we got to talk about it a little bit, it's that stoned ape theory. What What was, how did you, tell me your understanding of it. 